As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder, you, sh you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. He said to Jesus, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go sell what you own and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When the man heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, then, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. Peter began to say to Jesus, Look, we have left everything and followed you. And Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake the sake of the good news, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age, houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, fields, with persecutions, and in the age to come eternally. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. So it's the reading. spring of understanding would come to you having heard these verses from Mark's gospel. And there are several verses and there are various strands to this story, to this piece of scripture. Help us to not get so caught up in trying to remember everything that has been read and heard. But to listen for the way in which you are inviting each of us to this time of year, one thing that starts piling up faster than leaves out in the yard is catalogs from every company under the sun. <laughs> and each catalog boasts that one item that is simply imperative, a must-buy, presumably for the man or the woman who has everything. And next year, 2016 at this time, that same catalog will be boasting some new thing for the folks who bought this year's item and now they need a new thing for the person who now again has everything. And so we stand at the cusp of the holiday season and the catalog season, inundated with things to get. And beneath the sales pitches there is that implicit assumption that the next thing will make us happy. After all, we generally part with our cash to make ourselves sad or even indifferent. And so young and eager ad writers spend hours a day generating adjectives to help us to buy. Words like vintage, classic, and inspiring, savory, succulent, elegant, and decadent. And buy we do. Just another little something special. <coughs> for that special little someone. And we don't have to be rich to find ourselves 25 years down the line wondering where all this stuff came from and where to stash it. <laughs> Which is probably why we as a nation
congregation participate in the great roulette wheel known as yard sale, <laughs> whereby all our stuff migrates around the country, but nobody ever gets rid of it. <laughs> By the time that this man kneels at the feet of Jesus, he had all the stuff. But he wanted more. But what? We may well ask ourselves, what brought this obviously well-to-do, reasonably righteous man into the vicinity of a dusty rabbi from Nazareth? I mean, it stands to reason that somebody who's on top of this world doesn't generally look to the next. The next world. But he did. He acquired what was needed to inherit eternal life. Life everlasting. Life after this life. The life which had seemingly rewarded him very well. And Jesus takes this teachable moment to go back to the basics reciting some of the Ten Commandments, the, generally the ones which govern how we treat each other. Don't kill, steal, play around, or lie. To which the man responds, I'm good, did that, got a t-shirt, square on those counts. I wonder if Jesus knew that already. Did he believe the guy was as righteous as he claimed? In any event, Jesus then does something both tender and frightening. He looks at the man with deepest love and wisdom, and he delivers a bracing payload of truth, a double command. Sell all you have, give it away, and come follow me. At this point, the man asks no more questions. Would you? You probably wish you kept quiet. I think we generally love to be asked questions that we can answer. And what a joy it is when someone finally asks you or me about something we know a lot about. Our pet, or our grandchild, or our hobby, or vacation. Watch out, you better find a comfy chair because this could take a while. But questions we can't answer can be trouble. Or worse yet, questions that maybe aren't so hard to answer, but we don't like the answer. As with the wealthy man. He went away shocked and greedy. The crazy thing is, is that we might think that being asked to let go of what he was carrying would be free. It might be lighter on his feet, with less stuff to ride her back. But it's amazing what we find essential. During the French and Indian War, some British officers traveled through America's North Country, followed by wagon loads of luxury items, including fine china and wooden furniture. In Europe, before, along well-paved roads, that's how officers traveled. But along Native American trails of upstate New York and Canada, that sort of baggage was ludicrous. <laughs> Yet, even if confronted by the very Son of God himself, many of us resist the invitation to let go, just like those British officers. So convinced are we that what we carry is essential. And it's not just about our furniture cars or real estate either. Some of what we carry, what we find most precious, least negotiable, are feelings, attitudes. I may change jobs, I may change houses and even spouses, but don't ever ask me to change my mind. Like pushing a camel through an eye of a nail. But who can be saved? left to our own devices, forget it. But we aren't left to our own devices, no matter how fancy our devices are, thankfully. A bunch of years ago, somebody gave me a little sculpted ceramic cross that is now perched above my workbench down in the basement. It's not very pretty, and it's a heck of a dust uh, magnet. But I leave it right where it is. 
The inscription underneath the cross reads, With God all things are possible. Which is exactly the message I need down there when I'm doing woodwork. <laughs> found it to be very comforting more than once. And that's the truth that Jesus asks us to lean upon heavily at times. The truth that Peter was slowly coming to trust when he said, We've left, left everything to follow you. So where does all this hit the road? When and where in our lives are we being invited to leave behind what we may have so dutifully toted along for years? Hopefully in order to find new life in Christ when we do let it go. What do we hold that's so comfortable and familiar and yet at some deep level we know is bogging us down? Well, here's where I want to share a silly little tale that I think I used once before in a message some years ago, but if you've heard it before, you can just give yourself like an attendance award for having been here enough to catch it twice. That's the good side. It goes like this. A man bought a brand new motorboat and trailed it down to the marina to put it into the water for its maiden voyage. New to this whole boating thing, he was excited to try out his new toy. He got in the boat, pushed off, and started it up. But after a very few frustrating moments out in the water, not very far, he slowly chucked back to the dock and saw out the salesman who sold him the boat. And with deep disappointment, he said, I fired her up, put her in here, hit the throttle, but she was terribly sluggish, and I never even got her up the plane. I wonder if I need a bigger motor. The salesman then called the mechanic and gave the motor a thorough check over. Finally, after much head scratching, the salesman took one more look at the boat moored at the dock. <coughs> Problem solved. Still latched to the bottom of the boat was the trailer. <laughs> <laughs> we carry so much. <laughs> Perhaps we carry so much that it, at one time, the stuff that we did carry was adaptive. It, it helped us. But now its helpfulness is past. It's just dead weight. It's deadened weight. To continue with the nautical motif a little bit more, there are a whole lot of ships that lie at the bottom of the ocean. Many are old fighting ships from one or another war. And it's not uncommon for some of these old girls to still be carrying unused and frankly very dangerous ammunition. Divers explore these wrecks at their peril, these loaded relics. We sometimes do the same as human beings. We carry ammo from conflicts long past, still poised for battle. A battle that may have raged years ago in our family of origin or in some other chapter of our life, but a battle no longer being fought. And yet we still hold the guns, loaded and ready. It's not just too many shirts or socks or cars or stock certificates that can impede our progress to the kingdom of God. It's also old hurts, old wounds, not evil. And on our own, we're sunk. But by the grace of God, we have hope. There's help. There are communities of faith. There are mental health practitioners, spiritual practices, recovery groups, friends, all of which can help us lighten our load if we so choose to live lighter, brighter, better. Find not just the promise of eternal life, but in a sense, new internal life, the life of the Spirit. 